The 2003 forest fire season began with a roar in March and gave no relief until July. Bullseye 73, nice shooting guys for what you can see down there. There was a fire 32 kilometers northwest of Fort Francis that broke out Saturday afternoon. And in the very dry conditions that we're experiencing right now, that fire spread to 100 hectares before the end of the day. It took uh, three water bombers, a couple of helicopters, six fire ranger crews, along with some municipal help to actually stop that fire from spreading. So the conditions up here in the northwest are very dry right now, and we're experiencing some extreme fire behavior. Almost 90 fires have broken out so far this spring, all of which were caused by human activity. With the arrival of summer, the fire program faced added pressure. At the present time, we're dealing with a major evacuation from the remote northern First Nation community of Casabonica to a receiving centre located in the town of Geraldton. Dependent upon the fire condition, uh, the smoke in the going into the particular community, that will determine to a large degree when people will be able to return back to their community. On June 18th, Sulacote Fire Number 48 was reported. Presently with the conditions that we have right now, it's very hot, it's very dry, and the only way that we can control this fire is to use fire. We fight fire with fire. We're presently burning out on the south end of the fire, and we want to remove the fuels from the south end of the fire down to Deception Bay, which is a large body of water between the main fire and the town of Sulacout. By removing the fuels, bringing it down to the natural boundary, we will take away the threat of that fire and crouching on the town of Sulacout and take away the threat from fire. Tonight, firefight. The heat's on as flames tear through Canada's forests. The National. Good evening. The scale is hard to imagine. Hundreds of thousands of hectares in flames. Entire islands ablaze. Communities facing evacuation. Forest fires, sometimes massive ones, are roaring across parts of Canada. Firefighting resources are stretched to the limit, attacking wildfires in northern Alberta, central and northern Saskatchewan, and in central Manitoba. But the worst hit province is Ontario. That's where fire crews from across the country are heading, and that's where we begin tonight. Here's Heather Hiscox. Even the veteran firefighters in northwestern Ontario say they've never seen it so dry. Never seen lightning touch off such ferocity. I think we had something like 13,000 strikes at one time there, and just ever since that came through, we've been picking up fires. There are dozens now advancing at 30 meters a minute, burning deep into the ground. In just days, the fires have doubled, then tripled in size, and now cover an area one-third the size of Prince Edward Island. Fires burning so intensely with so much fuel that it would, it would be virtually like dispatching a bunch of little kids with water pistols to attack a barn full of hay on fire. From daylight to dark, water bombers fly blind into the smoke while crews on the ground dig and spray, steering the flames toward water or some natural boundary. And igniting controlled burns to rob the wildfires of fuel. Firefighters are barely keeping up. You're black, you're dirty, you're sweating. Days like this, we're getting temperatures above 30 degrees. You're drinking all the water that you can. Adrenaline's keeping the crews going and just the fact that fires are business. Already, nearly a thousand people from two communities have been forced from their homes. The smoke and flames now threatening three more towns. Firefighters from B.C. and the territories are helping crews in Manitoba and Ontario. Hundreds more will arrive tomorrow. We've mobilized quite a bit in the last uh, five to seven days, and it's becoming increasingly more difficult to find availability. What firefighters in both provinces need is rain. The forecast tonight is for severe weather, rain that will tame some flames, but lightning that will likely spark more. Heather Hiscox, CBC News, Toronto. 
It rained throughout a wide swath of northwest Ontario today, and more rain is forecast for tomorrow. That's the kind of weather report hundreds of firefighters were waiting for. The rain alone isn't enough to put out the biggest fires. That takes a lot of grunt work by the firefighters. As Mike Agile reports, they were taking good advantage of the wet weather to deal with hot spots in one of the worst hit areas near Sioux Lookout. Uh, the rain has come. It settled things down quite well, but the fire is not out. For these firefighters, the time to strike is now. You don't give fire any mercy. It, it won't give you any mercy. You have, to, you have to hit fire hard. The rain has dampened many of the fires, taming the heat and allowing crews to get close enough to put down the flames for good. I'm just noticing on these piles back here, everything's burning real deep, so this, this sucker is going to take a lot of water to get out. Now a game of hide-and-seek begins. Fire will nestle away in logs and brush. The only way to extinguish it is to comb the landscape on foot. See, it's not what you're worried about. It's very important that firefighters find every single smudge, every single hot spot on a fire before it's declared out because the last thing we want to do is come back here and put the fire out for the second time. These are just hot spots? The land is rough, the work tedious, but for many firefighters, it's all worth it. It's something to be proud of being out here and working hard like this. Uh, people look up to it and you get a job done that is very important. Their work is not going unnoticed Come through. by residents in nearby towns. I know that they've, they've made this their priority one and we're, we're quite thankful and grateful that they were coming and, and the rain gods were with us because that's what really, really helped us. Still, many fires continue to burn further north. Evacuees are still away from home. So are hundreds of firefighters who are determined to finish the job. Mike Edgel, CBC News, near Sioux Lookout, Ontario. Just as the Ontario situation was easing, things were heating up in Western Canada. We'd like to welcome you aboard flight number 117 shortly departing for Kamloops. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've not already done so, please ensure all carry-on baggage is placed directly underneath the seat facing you or in the overhead compartments for taxi takeoff landing and Indian flight turbulence. More firefighter reinforcements pour into the Kamloops area to help us with the worst forest fire situation in decades. These men and women, over a hundred of them killed, joining 270 of their colleagues already here. British Columbia Forest Service folks came to Ontario at the end of June to help us out when we had a serious fire situation. We had a number of large fires burning in northern Ontario. We're fortunate enough that we can come here to BC and help them with their situation. We've got rain, so everything that we can do to help folks in British Columbia were doing. How many people did you bring up? There's people coming and there's people going all the time uh, in the neighborhood of 400. Okay, we'll make, uh, we'll make this quick, you guys, and uh, let you get on with what we're, uh, assignments are for the day. They had a hard time uh, with value protection yesterday in a couple areas, I think uh, just to the south of where most of us were working, as well as over on the west flank. Um, they had a lot of values getting threatened, uh, microwave towers on the west side, stuff like that. So preventing further structure loss is uh, one of the main objectives. It burned right, right up to the, basically the wall of the house. Some of the grass right to the, touching the house. They caught and saved a lot of them. The industries are extreme. It's uh, stumps that are burned and they're completely consumed. Like if you step on them, you fall into the ground. Some of the crews are working in rubble of uh, burned over buildings, which is pretty strange. We're uh, constantly working in and out of urban interface, like you're standing beside a house one minute. It's, it's a very uh, strange environment for fighting fire. When we get the call, we put together three entire virus protection teams. Uh, which are comprised of four four-person range crews, a uh, division superintendent, and a branch director for each structural protection team, and then a, uh, a structural protection coordinator, which is the role that I'm filling here. Here, here. If that's where they want yeah. to go. Yeah. Uh, the equipment that we, the initial load that we came with us, we're able to protect probably upwards of 
200 structures and their associated outbuildings, the ones that are close to the structure. It's a unique common sense method of saving homes in the path of a forest fire. Over the weekend, three value protection teams from Ontario moved ahead of the McClure fire north of Barrier, installing sprinkler systems on homes, pumping water from ponds and wells. The procedure developed by Ontario firefighters raises the humidity level around the homes, making it difficult for a passing fire to catch hold. I've got good water supply, and then it's, chances are like 95% we're going to save the structure. We have plenty of help in BC this summer, 2,500 on the line, including 400 firefighters from Ontario, many more from other parts of Canada all of them bringing their firefighting expertise with them. There's a learning curve in what they do and what we do? Sure there is. And uh, we use, uh, some of our equipment is different than theirs. Uh, our, some of our processes, procedures are, are different than theirs and we learn from one another and that's uh, the way it should be. The McClure fire is now 50% contained, but it's just one fire. There are over 840 more burning. BC's long hot summer in the forest is far from over. Uh, there's been a lot of work going here, and we're not going to quit the site here. We're going to stay all over it. And uh, the swimming pool is the best thing that could happen. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to keep it. <laughs> we're making a plan here for to run out of there for this place if something go wrong. Everybody was evacuated out here. Um, it was the police car, or their own car. They had the choice. And um, but I was watching it from town. And it was just a horrendous sight. It was just the, the mushroom cloud and the, the smoke rising was just unbelievable and very, very scary. And so to come in here this morning and see what's here is just overwhelmingly uh, joyful. So much appreciated. <laughs> Worked out great. Sprinklers. Sprinklers, just incredible. Worked well. Very well. Well, my house is here. There's a lot of effort's gone into this place. It's going to be Extremely gra grateful. I can't believe uh, you guys have come all the way from Ontario and people have just been pitching in and it's incredible. What we're facing here is stuff we're not used to. Like, nighttime is just extreme because, I mean, we, we've all seen flames in the daytime, but man, at night, it, you can hear it, everything's quieter, it just seems it sounds louder and they're brighter and it's huge. And then, of course, on the side of the mountain, you can see it so easily. It's just wild. It's so bright. It's just, you're just awestruck by it. All night, we hear, you're working, and you hear logs sliding down the hill. You can see something roll down, and then it just lit right up, torched up the green fuel and off and goes again. Flames shooting in the air in the middle of the night. It was pretty crazy. But everything's looking good. Looks like we did a good job. You see as great as the wind. They're, they're a little bit lighter today, 5 to 10 kilometers an hour. We've got some gusts up to 20. So just see where the wind, the wind picks up, not where your scamper is in. So if there's one yeah, thing I'm firefighters know for sure, 41 Charlie and 41 Delta. It's that okay. circumstances here are always changing. Strong winds are pushing the fire further and faster. Two of the three major fires grew overnight. The McClure fire is now 8,400 hectares. Military and out-of-province firefighters from the Northwest Territories, Alberta, the Yukon, New Brunswick, and Ontario are here to help. About 1,900 people are fighting the flames. This Ontario firefighter was interviewed by one of his colleagues. They're experiencing a different train, a little rough, and it's bloody hot. Like, they're just, we're not used to working in 40 Celsius weather. The fires are costing taxpayers $2.5 million a day. Fire investigators believe many were caused by people, but because of the extreme heat and large area, they may never know the exact cause. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Kamloops, British Columbia. Thousands of firefighters struggle as millions of dollars go up in smoke each day and there's not a drop of rain in sight. This means war. Overworked crews need all the help they can get. Three fires are raging in the desert-hot interior of British Columbia. Never before have firefighters here seen things so bad. Preventing further structure loss is uh, one of the main objectives. Joined by their colleagues from Ontario, crews are storing up water. 
and protecting homes is a priority. They work most often in areas deemed safe. The fires are too intense to stop. Just as fire crews began returning home, the weather was heating up and the fire hazards were climbing in the West Fire region. Kenora Fire 110 erupted in the Catherine Lake area northwest of Menaki on August 17th. Five cottages were lost and an investigation on its cause ensued. This fire required a multi-agency response of municipal and area fire departments, air and ground attack. Well, this is the main cottage over here. Over 36 years, Bob Bridgewater big, built two cottages and he cherished them. Lots of good times. But this weekend, he found this. It looks like that uh, uh, was a bombing and this is all what's left of the cottage. The forest fire last week northwest of Kenora, Ontario destroyed his dream. Such a disaster. Just one of more than 7,000 fires this year across the country. In fact, if you look at the last 10 years nationally, this year isn't especially bad, just a little above average. But the difference has been in the way it's affected people. Homes were evacuated in Nova Scotia, in Quebec. That's a lot of fire. In northwestern Ontario, in Manitoba, more than 400,000 hectares of forest gone. In Alberta, entire towns feared they would be lost. Then, of course, B.C. with the most fires, threatening densely populated areas and forcing people out of their homes. The solution, according to some, is to fight fewer fires, as long as people are not in the way, to let nature run its course. If we're continuing to put out fire, then that allows the insects to come in and start killing the trees, and that just adds to the fuel that we have to deal with. So it's much more explosive, so when a fire situation happens, then it's just harder to put out. There is a way to dramatically reduce the number of forest fires in Canada for people to stop setting them. Despite years of public education campaigns, still more than 40% of forest fires are set by careless people, one campfire and cigarette butt at a time. As for Bob Bridgewater, rebuilding is not an option. A lot older now. Not by his own hands anyway. Photos are his only souvenirs. Before and afters, he still can't believe. Mike Edgell, CBC News, Winnipeg. And so the 2003 fire season drew to a close, with few autumn fires and a return to a regular fall schedule, and the start of a series of reviews and debriefings to ensure the best practices of the season were carried over in preparation for the 2004 fire season.